welcome to Moving Students Forward, the kickoff webinar for the Chicago Equity Centered Innovation Forum, or CF. Thank you for your patience as we rescheduled from our previous date to allow our principals to attend a last minute meeting with CEO Jackson, who just announced that she would be leaving the district. So we're grateful you and they are here today. Uh, we're thrilled to host today's session, and I'm so pleased to see everybody um, here and the strong interest in innovation by today's turnout. My name is Ginger Reynolds. I'm Senior Fellow at Education Systems Center, and I'd also like to introduce my colleague and CF partner, Damar Smith, who is Program Manager for Competency-Based Education at Chicago Public Schools. Today, we're happy to be joined by many educators from CPS and from over 20 additional districts across the state. We're also grateful to have representatives in the room from a variety of organizations, including several universities, community colleges, philanthropies, community-based organizations, and school and student support organizations. A quick note that we are recording the session for those whose schedules didn't allow them to attend. So we will post the recording and the deck for you to reference after the meeting. Also, I'll speak to the agenda in a minute, but please feel free to use the chat as we go as we go along. Damar and I and our colleague Sarah will help to monitor it. Hi, Sarah. So there are three purposes to today's meeting: to introduce the Chicago Equity Centered Innovation Forum and its goals, to begin to build community so we can innovate and learn together, and to explore some exciting innovations at CPS School. Today's a start. As we move forward, we hope to build a tighter community through more intimate meetings and the kind of sharing you'll hear from our three CPS schools and hopefully through the discussion we'll have with them and with each other. Today's agenda starts with a request to set your mind on curious, followed by an introduction to CF, and then an introduction to the CPS CBE Summer Extended Learning Program. And I know we're all excited to hear from the schools who will help us explore extended learning using competency concepts as a more equitable strategy for credit recovery from COVID disruptions and for more equitably providing students with summer accelerated learning. Around the country, schools are working through how to use the summer to compensate for the pandemic disruption. And these schools have been at the forefront of this kind of work for years. We're excited to be able to hear and learn from their experience. I want to extend my welcome and thanks to Benito Juarez Community Academy High School, <coughs> excuse me, Gwendolyn Brooks College Preparatory Academy, and Phoenix STEM Military Academy High School. They will share promising practices and lessons learned, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for interactive Q&A with you. The last part of our meeting will be a chance for you to weigh in on what you heard and what you'd like to know more about. And finally, I'll share some resources for your further inquiry as we begin to build a bank of support. Here's what we're hoping to get from you today. We hope you'll be curious. We hope you'll ask questions. We also hope you'll share what you know. None of us have the answers. We don't even know all the questions, but we hope you'll help us create fertile space to learn together. As for how we'll engage, please keep your cameras on if possible. We'd love to see your faces and connect with you. Also, please do your best to participate. There will be several opportunities to contribute, including question and answer time and surveys. And again, please use the chat as we go along. And of course, we're all in dynamic spaces, but as much as possible, please be fully present. These opportunities are only as good as we collectively make them. And don't be shy. We want to do our best to make this a joint learning experience. So use the chat to comment, to let us know what you need, and to engage with each other. So who is CF and what are we trying to accomplish? The Chicago Equity Centered Innovation Forum is a partnership between Education Systems Center and Chicago Public Schools aimed at supporting innovative models for addressing systemic inequities. It will provide space for innovators in Chicago high schools and high schools across the state to share best practices and strategize towards solutions, to get support and guidance from national experts, and to investigate implementation models from other Illinois districts and other states. The shortcomings of remote instruction, 
the disparate impact of the pandemic, and the racial reckoning sparked by police brutality have shown a spotlight on deeply embedded injustices in our schools. We want to seize this moment and the lessons we've learned to innovate to move forward better. We want to create an environment that is conducive to innovating and learning together. So as I mentioned, CF is a partnership between Education Systems Center and Chicago Public Schools. And for some quick background on Ed Systems, please join me in welcoming its Executive Director, Jonathan Fur. Thank you, Ginger. It's a real pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, as Ginger mentioned, I'm John Furr, the Executive Director of Education Systems Center. We're based in the Outreach Division of Northern Illinois University. And you can see our mission just focus on strength, shaping and strengthening education and workforce systems, preparing more young people for productive careers and lives in a global economy. And we have three kind of areas that we focus on. Um, college and career pathway systems, really looking at structures from middle and high school into college and careers. Also focusing on bridges to post-secondary, which is both uh, accelerating early college credit opportunities, as well as addressing remedial needs for students as they're transitioning from high school into post-secondary. And data is our last area that we have a strong focus on. So looking at how we can bring together data uh, across um, uh, educational systems and with the workforce as well. And in terms of where we work, we do a significant amount of work at the state level. This is a, this is included being very much involved in the policy space, including helping to spearhead and, and draft and lead the work around the Post-Secondary and Workforce Readiness Act, which created the competency-based um, education pilot, which many of the schools we hear from today are part of that pilot work. Uh, we've also been very much involved with a lot of community network level efforts, and that includes our work in Chicago, where we've been working closely with CPS and city colleges around a number of the roadmap initiatives and different strategies that kind of relate to the three areas that you see here, as well as doing some deep work in other communities. I see we have some colleagues from the Elgin area that we do work with, uh, from Rockford, from various other locations across the state. And lastly, always looking for strategic opportunities and opportunities to see where there are um, um, innovations within the field that we can help to elevate to our statewide and our community level work. So that's quick background on us. Again, we're really uh, proud and honored to be part of this effort and to uh, be with you all this afternoon. Thanks, John. Um, a quick note on language. We are intentionally avoiding categorizing this work as necessarily competency-based education since that term means such different things to different people. Instead, when we say innovative instructional models, we're talking about things like student-centered personalized instruction, mastery-based approaches, performance assessments, and project-based learning. CF is aiming to identify, support, and amplify models that un are unlikely to emerge from schools making more incremental changes. And so many educators are ready and eager to find new approaches. It's unlikely we'll return to school as it used to be, and we shouldn't. We hope this forum will provide space to learn together. CF will hold several community of practice meetings for schools and districts interested in innovating. Ed Systems will include the emerging best practice and lessons learned in its newsletters and blogs, and will build a resource bank to support educators as they dive more deeply into the work. So now I'll turn things over to my colleague, Damar Smith, to talk about competency-based education summer extended learning at CPS. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, yes, again, my name is Damar Smith. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Competency-Based Education at Chicago Public Schools. Really excited uh, to talk to you today about summer extended learning, which essentially started off as a promising practice across a few of our schools and has elevated to scale across more of our schools to provide programming for more students, more schools, uh, more courses, and more opportunities for our students. We can go to the next slide. All right, so when we look at the landscape of competency-based education at CPS, we have 11 high schools that are uh, implementing CBE. And out of the 11, you can see arrows by uh, the names of different schools that are actually providing summer extended learning opportunities this year coming up this summer, um, summer 2022, that's what we're, talking, we're calling it, right? So Gwendolyn Brooks and Benita Juarez of Phoenix Military, you will hear from today, 
but we have additional schools that are doing this work and are really excited about providing this opportunity to our students. Let's go to the next slide. So what is summer extended learning? And so it's two different buckets, uh, mastery courses that are provided to students that need uh, additional instruction and additional instructional time um, to meet proficiency. And so look at it as credit recovery, but in a more equitable way. And so if a student needs to focus on a couple of competencies, and you might look at this as standards, if you're doing standards-based grading, and they just only need to focus on those particular competencies for that particular time. We open up a window of about four weeks for students to be able to participate. And as soon as a student needs mastery, they no longer need to be in summer extended learning mastery courses. They move on. This connects to CPS's high school impact goals of 90% of our freshmen being on track and 90% of our students graduating within five years. Um, and then we have acceleration courses, which are opportunities for students to participate in credit bearing courses over the summer that lead to AP courses, dual enrollment, dual credit. Um, and it's a part of our CPS high school impact goals as well, that 60% of our students graduate earning early college career credentials and 90% of our students graduate um, on time within five years. And if students are earning more credits throughout, the, throughout their time, um, they're obviously for pursuing um, different, different opportunities and moving a lot quicker um, than maybe other, some, some other students. So we can go to the next slide. So here are some key data points. And we look at the summer of 2019, 2020 as the beginning of that school year, as the fiscal, the fiscal year starts. And we had about 500 students participate. And we've been doing this work for two years going into our third summer. So I just wanna reiterate that. Um, we had about 500 students participate in our first go around and 61% of those students met proficiency through mastery courses. We also offered in terms of um, the schools that we provided um, funding for, um, one school offered acceleration courses that year and 18 students participated. So we had a goal at the end. Um, we had conversations with schools and had a debrief and we wanted to increase the number of students that were passing our courses over the summer uh, that are participating in mastery courses. Uh, we wanted to increase the number of um, schools that are providing acceleration opportunities and the number of students that were participating. So as you see the numbers, those were our goals. And as we got to the end of summer 2021, um, that was last summer, 78% of our students that participated in mastery courses met proficiency. Four schools offered acceleration courses and 254 students participated. 224 students met proficiency. So that's an 88% proficiency rate. We're really elated about that, excited about the fact that our students have been progressing and taking advantage of these opportunities, even during a pandemic. And so that just speaks to um, their agency and their interest and taking on these um, opportunities. I'm really excited that this year we're going to also offer, offer dual enrollment opportunities directly to students to be able to participate. So we'll have a small cohort of students that will be able to take city college courses this year. So without further ado, I'm not going to go on in terms of data and slides related to data. I'm not going to do that. Um, I think you really want to hear from the people that are on the ground doing the work um, the, the principals, the, the teachers, the students that are impacted, uh, taking full advantage of these opportunities. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Benito Juarez Community Academy, and you can hear from Principal Ocon and Don Brewer, student leader. Thank you. Thank you, Damar, and thank you, Ginger, for our, this invitation. We are always excited to share uh, our journey into competency-based education. Uh, because we, we truly believe that um, it is uh, a moral imperative um, that we um, as schools begin to really reimagine and reinvent what teaching and learning um, should be or should have been all along, I should say. Um, and uh, for us, our journey to competency-based education started in 2010 uh, when we um, transitioned from a traditional curriculum to a standards-based curriculum. In 2016, we transitioned to competency-based education. 
Um, and with me today is um, an amazing uh, student leader, Don Brewer, and you will be able to hear from him uh, in a moment. He's really the one you wanna hear from, not me. The next slide, please, Sarah. Um, this is a very important uh, slide for us. Um, CBE is our equity stance, and it has been our equity stance um, since 2010 when we transitioned away from the traditional curriculum. Um, at Juarez, uh, we truly believe that CBE is an anti-racist system that prepares every student for success, uh, regardless of the context. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that um, this uh, holds true is, is that we have rigorous academic standards that truly focus on the higher order thinking skills that are necessary to be successful um, in the 21st century. Again, regardless of what context the students are in, um, the skills that they acquire in a CBE school are necessary uh, for success in whatever facet of life. And the reason for that is because CBE truly replaces time-based schooling with learning-based schooling. That means that we do not place emphasis on seat time, but rather on learning time. And one way that we do that is by uh, creating systems and structures that truly support students, uh, student learning. Next slide, please. Today, um, we're gonna focus just for a moment on one very important aspect of competency-based education here at Juarez. One of the features, um, critical elements of CBE is that students must be provided with multiple opportunities to demonstrate proficiency or mastery of competencies. Well, for us here at Juarez, in order to do that, we needed to begin dismantling the traditional educational system. If we were going to provide students with multiple opportunities to demonstrate proficiency, then certain things needed to um, be dismantled. Um, one of those things is this idea of semester long courses. Um, in order for us to truly create the conditions for students to learn at their own pace, we needed to create our own timeline, um, a timeline that truly captured when learning happened. And it isn't that after all the point of education that we create systems and structures that support when learning happens, not the other way around. And so we made a decision uh, that we were going to move away from semester long courses to year long courses. Um, and for us, that meant that all of our courses extend through the second week in August. So our students have until the second week in August to demonstrate proficiency of our competence. Think about what that means for teaching, what that means for learning. Um, it creates so many opportunities, not just for our students, but for our teachers as well. In order for us to, to stay true to um, the tenets of competency-based education, we had to eliminate midterms uh, or finals. For us, formative assess assessments are used to determine proficiency. The reason for this is that um, we wanted to make sure that everything that we do here is formative, that everything is formatively assessed. And when students are given feedback through a formative assessment cycle, that is when learning happens. Um, and in order for us to um, continue our work into the second week of August, we needed to eliminate the traditional credit recovery uh, summer and evening programs. And we did that um, in 2010. In fact, we haven't had credit recovery summer and evening school here since 2010. What we have instead is extended learning opportunities. That means that when the CPS calendar ends for students here at Juarez, um, that really has very little weight 
um, on our school community because students who still have not demonstrated proficiency of competencies continue in school the very next day. Um, and the wonderful thing about that, and I believe Ginger spoke about that uh, earlier and Damar spoke about that earlier as well, is that because it is self-paced and personalized, summer extended learning opportunities end when those students demonstrate proficiency of those competencies in which they had a not yet, or in our case, a slash, for example. Um, that um, has been a game changer for us um, in so many ways. And again, um, I'd like for us to think about the implications on teaching and learning on planning uh, on professional development. Um, it is uh, a robust system that allows us to truly holistically address the needs of our teachers and our students. Next slide, please. In order for um, us to do summer CBE well, um, we need to have extended um, year-round interventions for students. Um, and so what you see on the screen is an example of interventions that we apply every year at different times of the year. Um, this is one of our current interventions um, and we introduced this at the beginning of fourth quarter. The um, teachers are not um, teaching any new performance indicators. What we are doing now is uh, creating opportunities for students to demonstrate proficiencies in the competencies that have already been assessed. The wonderful thing about um, our system um, of competency-based education is that our competencies are content agnostic. That means that we don't focus on content, we instead focus on the habits of the discipline, right? In other words, our goal is for our students to, to be, to think, to act like literaries or mathematicians or historians. And in that sense, the context doesn't matter. What matters is the skills, the competencies that they acquire and how they apply those competencies. And so these interventions that you see here on the screen are in play at the moment here at our school. Um, and a version or a different iteration of this takes place um, at different times during the year to allow for true feedback to happen between student and teacher. Um, the last bullet on this screen, um, on this slide, is about providing feedback. Uh, feedback that is that is actionable, that is specific and purposeful, um, and, and that uh, it allows students to improve on their work. That's the focus of the fourth quarter. And again, that has implications for our summer CBE, and that has implications for teaching and learning. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that I have with me a, a superstar. Uh, his name is Don Brewer, and he's uh, an amazing student leader at our school. And I'm going to let him talk about the student experience here at Juarez. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, um, again, my name is Don Brewer. I'm a senior here at Juarez. Um, yeah, this is my last year. Um, next year, I'm going to be attending Columbia, um, studying musical theater. Just a little background about myself. Um, um, so first I wanted to talk about um, student CBE and the purpose and the vision. So just like Ocon was just saying um, about like providing like purpose and um, feedback into like the school, um, not only into the school, like the work, the teaching, um, the communication. Um, I feel um, student CBE brings like a student voice to like the table of like different conversations that we have in like the building um, when it comes to like curriculum or um, decisions that not only will affect teachers, but also students or staff as like a whole. Um, so student CBE, um, just bringing student voice to like the table, just to um, get a better understanding of what we want and need as students, if that makes sense. Um, um, yeah, um, I've been involved for 
all my four years of um high school um i started as a little freshman um at first it can be like very um int intimidating but basically it's like a way to share your story um where you come from like from middle school and and i feel and like our meetings um previously over the years we talk about like the different traumas we went through in middle school and like what we would like or want to see in a high school um so i think that can um make a very big impact so that's kind of how i've been involved because it's just like i know what I would like to see in a school building and in a setting where I'm coming to learn every single day. So yeah, I'm um, reforming of like the building of like what we're learning, how we're learning. And yeah, um, what I'm most proud about um, being um, like a member, um, <laughs> everyone calls me a student leader. Um, coming to Juarez, coming to high school, I was just gonna do theater, do music, and just go home. Um, but I'm pretty um, verbal when it comes to like um, my thoughts, my feelings towards anything. And I feel like for a while now, I've been very like question authority and like change what's wrong and fix, you know. Um, but I guess what I'm pretty proud of is that people, students um, feel comfortable coming to me with questions like, oh, what are we gonna do about this? It's it's like a sense of hope, like the adults are not just in charge, you know? Like we're also at, like we also have a seat at the table. Um, we also have a say so, and we're also gonna be heard. Um, um, I wanted to talk about um, CBE and how it's like, influenced like the curriculum. Um, so it's been a huge change. Um, here we don't get letter grades, so we don't get A's, B's, C's, or you know, F's, etc. Um, you know, that's like a big change. Um, when it comes to like our grading system, like Ocom mentioned earlier, we don't have like semester long um, um, periods in school, so like our whole like grading is like year long. And me personally, I think it's so much better because I've been screaming up and down that everyone is different. We all learn at different paces. And I just feel like when we get sectioned off by these different semesters, it's like a cage. And it's just like some people may exceed and some people might be stuck. And it's just like with that much time, there's so much more room for growth and then mastery. And then we'll see like different um, scores, different tests, different um, um, competencies go up and um, more understanding in the classroom. That's what I think um, many students agree and it's just been great so far. Um, I wanted to talk about something that we have here in the building, developmental um, competencies. I don't know if we went over them, but I'm gonna go over them quickly. Um, self-awareness, self-management, perseverance, relationship skills, um, social awareness. And so basically around the building, we do have like different posters just to like remind you like, oh, are you working on this? What does it mean? And like, have you ever thought about them previously before seeing this poster? And basically before even seeing the posters, I had never really thought about like, how was I doing like as a person um not only as an actor as a performer as a singer but like not, not even as a student but like as a person deep down as don like how am i doing um but it does help you um work on yourself like um i'm very um i feel like something i needed to work on the most in like my life was being self-aware because there are times where you could say something and you might think it's fine and it could like totally offend like an entire crowd of people so I'm um, socially aware, self-aware that all oh, what I'm saying can affect people, um, you know, and throughout all of this, I think we all have had to work um, on our perseverance, especially during the whole pandemic. Um, sometimes even myself, it felt like I was just being closed in and that I wanted to just give up and so much more, but we can't. And um, that's why we have these things around the building. We talk about it and like our programs, we have enrichment um, advisory and we work on these different um, developmental competencies. Um, hopefully one day we can talk about them more, but in the short time, 
that's all I got for now. But finally, I wanted to talk about summer CBE. Um, like Mr. O'Connor mentioned earlier, um, let's say um, the student is not finished with their um, with their mastery, with their um, competencies. We have until August, I forgot, was it second? August, the second week of August. Um, yeah, so we have that much, even more time to work on it. So basically um, how I feel about it, it's just, like I said, we all learn differently. We learn at different paces and um, yeah, it just gives students more time and the extra like attention and um, um, time with teachers to master like these different competencies and understanding. Um, CBE, honestly, being in Juarez, I wanna zoom in on my senior year this year in particular. If CBE wasn't a thing, I would not be graduating in two weeks. I would not. Um, I just wanted to say that <laughs> because um, not that I got lazy or anything, it's just the fact that the whole pandemic, the whole um, injustices that were happening in the world, um, it's kind of took a toll on me personally. And, um, you know, sometimes we get into like our show, but that's why I was saying the developmental competencies, we need to learn how to bounce back and work on ourselves um, in different areas. Um, I can say so much more, <laughs> so much more, but um, next slide. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Don. Um, we'll we'll finish with uh, with this slide um, because if um, there is any evidence that I can present to you um, that there is something uh, truly innovative happening at our school, um, it is this slide uh, because it truly captures an entire school community focused on competency-based education, um, same vision, same mission, putting students at the center of everything that we do and uh, making sure that the systems and the structures uh, that we use here um, are set up for student success. Damar and Ginger, I, I believe it's now q and is that correct? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you both so much. Um, Don, I, actually, I was hoping maybe, Don, before we let you sort of check out, if you could, if you could give us an example of a specific, um, a specific class or a specific time when the flexibility of CBE really made a difference for you. You said this year with the pandemic, but maybe there's a specific class you could tell us about or a specific skill. It didn't even happen in the pandemic, but maybe give us an example. Ooh, um, all of them, <laughs> all of them. Um, I've never seen so many not yet in like the history of like my high school career. And like all my friends are just like, Don, you're failing out of all of us, you're failing. I'm just like, I know, I know. But if I had to choose one, it would be history. Um, I had like a six page paper to write and this was due a couple months ago. Um, it was our um, IA, um, internal assessment and um, basically you choose a topic and you have to um, dig up different pieces. So basically my project was on the, um, um, the civil rights movement and how art, including music was um, influential during that time. And um, I don't know, it's just like when it was, when the assignment was due and in the progress of everything, I just wasn't in the right mind and I just couldn't sit down and type up something. I couldn't sit down and write something. And I, I don't know, um, but I did turn it in today. Um, I got to be on it. I got to be on it. And I don't know. I just feel like if it wasn't for this grading, like this grading, great, pardon me. If it wasn't for this grading system, yeah, like I said, I would not be graduating. Um, I would be so behind. Um, and the teachers, they really work with us. Um, if we're behind on something, if we're confused about something, we'll dig up something for like a couple months ago. We'll read it for homework again and you know, go over it once, um, once we have some free time, one-on-one um, -on -one with the teacher after school, before school. Um, yeah, but if anything, history class. Um, we're passing now, so we're good. That's great. Thank you. Congratulations, first of all, for a really tough year and for, for getting through it. So congratulations. I, I want to 
<laughs> so great. Principal Acone, we have a couple of questions for you. I wonder, one of the questions is, have you seen this cause any delay in students reaching requirements in content areas? For example, not getting to Algebra 2. Can you speak to your experience about that? Uh, ab absolutely. Uh, no, there, ha there have been no delays. Um, in fact, the rigor in all of our classes um, has increased exponentially. Um, because we are focusing on the um, requisite skills and because in, um, in full transparency, what we did is adopt the IB objectives as our academic competencies. Um, and if you're familiar with the IB objectives, um, there is already so much uh, rigor uh, built into those objectives. Those have become our competencies. And those competencies, and I know Don can speak to them very well, especially the performance indicators under each competency. The reason that there has been no delay is because our um, assessment or approach to assessment is such that students are informed at all times how they are doing on specific indicators, indicators that with feedback um, are, are worked on um, as, as the year progresses. And so the, the students receive timely feedback on performance indicators that are connected to the competencies. And so that, that actually has in many ways accelerated learning um, and really changed teaching. Thank you. Um, we also had another question about, do you have any, are there any CTE programs associated with your summer extended learning? Yes, we, we have five CTE academies and they also uh, participate every, we are wall to wall CBE, every, every student, every teacher, we have 1734 students and every teacher from PE to chemistry and everyone and everything in between is doing CBE regardless of program. Um, we not only have um, five CTE academies, we also have an IB program and a, vi a visual and performing arts um, academy. And all of those are under the umbrella of competency-based education. Wonderful. We have a couple more questions, but I wanna be sure to get to our next school. So maybe um, at the end, if we can keep you around and, and pick your brain some more. Thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Cone. Really appreciate it. Samar, do you wanna take over here and introduce Brooks for us? Yeah, sure, sure. Really excited to do so. So um, now we have Gwendolyn Brooks, College Preparatory, and Shanae Jackson, Principal Shanae Jackson, Julia Ciceroa, a STEM teacher for CB and also a CB lead, and Michael Shores, um, STEM department chair and teaches math as well. So you'll hear from them and their journey with summer extended learning. So my name is Shanae Jackson, and as Damar said, I'm the principal of Brooks College Prep. Um, next slide, please. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Julia Sakura and Michael Shores. And again, Julia is our CBE lead, um, and she's a STEM teacher, and Mr. Shores is also a STEM teacher, and he's our math department chair. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about our mastery school and acceleration. Um, you heard from Juarez around mastery school, so we'll just do a brief overview of mastery school here at Brooks but the primary focus of our presentation will be on acceleration. We were actually in the first school, so the first school that DeMar showed on the timeline that was offering acceleration was our school. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Core and Mr. Shores um, very shortly after I go over our timeline of how we got here. Next slide, please. So this is kind of our timeline of our journey, and we like to refer to it as a journey <laughs> that we are still on. Um, but in 2014, 2015, the STEM department started with standards-based grading. Um, and so it kind of started in the STEM department, but it um, 
other departments as well started implementing standards-based grading. In 15 and 16, 2015-16, we went to school-wide standards-based grading, and we started refining our retake policy. So again, as Juarez talked about, you know, it is really critical to give students multiple opportunities to demonstrate mastery. Um, so teachers started working on retake assessments to ensure that students had multiple opportunities to demonstrate mastery. In 2016, 2017, we started with our academic center. So we started our seventh and eighth grade program. Um, and then we also started working on our SEL and adaptive competencies. And I believe, again, that Juarez spoke to some of those adaptive competencies or growth mindsets. Some people refer them, uh, refer, refer them um, as as well. Um, in addition to in 2017, 2018, we started using Jump Rope, a platform that was looking at the logic rule. Um, and we began or we started mastery school that year. So it runs very similar to what Juarez talked about here at Brooks, but we allow students to work past the semester, understanding that you know, it takes some students a little bit longer um, to achieve mastery. So <clears throat> um, that was kind of the start of our mastery school. We had several students that took advantage of mastery school and were very successful um, by the end of the summer. Oh, sorry, sorry, my phone was ringing. Um, and part of that had to do with the fact that students were given whatever time they needed basically to be able to demonstrate mastery. And so some of that, um, I'm sorry, my phone keeps ringing here, uh, but they had, they had as ample time as they needed to demonstrate mastery. So usually we ran mastery school from anywhere from two to four weeks, but as Juarez talked about, if students were able to reach mastery on their competencies in say two days or a week, then they were done with mastery school. Um, in 2018, 2019, we took a trip to Ridgewood School um, to visit and see what they were doing with their competency-based education there. And that was really impactful. So, you know, going to another school and seeing how they were implementing um, competency-based education was, was really eye-opening, I believe, for our team. We took about 17 to 18 teachers with us, as well as our admin staff went as well. And uh, I think Damar was there as well, but just to hear how another school in another district was implementing competency-based education was really important for us. Um, and that was when we started our summer acceleration. And again, Mr. Shores and Ms. Sakura will talk about that in a second in terms of um, our, summer, our summer acceleration and um, how students performed. In 2019, 2020, we moved to adaptive pacing and semester one mastery school. So adaptive pacing um, was something that we started there. And I believe Ms. Sakura was actually one of the teachers who spearheaded that, as well as a few of our other teachers started trying it. And so students were able to actually move at their own pace. Um, so you would literally walk into classes and see some students working on, you know, a set of competencies. Other students may have already reached mastery on those competencies, so they were allowed to advance. Teachers are pulling out students to give them targeted intervention based on um, formative assessment data. Uh, so just, you know, really, really making sure that we meet the needs of our students. At that time, we also started semester one mastery school. So generally we had mastery school in summer, but that year we started mastery school after semester one. So allowing kids to work past um, that semester. And as Juarez talked about removing um, some of the restrictions around seat time. In 2020, 2021, well, we were all here for that. Um, so it derailed our work slightly uh, I do think we were in a really good place 
because we had been implementing CBE to be able to um, transition very well to remote and hybrid learning. And part of the reason that I say that is because a lot of what we were doing before with playlists and whatnot were technology based. And so our students were often on Chromebooks and a lot of platforms that we were using uh, were online and allowing allowed kids to move at their own pace based on mastery. So when we transitioned to the remote and hybrid space, I do think it was um, a slightly easier transition for us because we had a lot of um, those things in place. But again, it did derail some of our work with CVE. And so we're really excited to um, have students back in the building next year and to resume some of um, the work that we had been working on prior to the pandemic. And so at this time, I wanna turn it over to Mr. Shores and Ms. Sakura. They're really gonna go in depth about the acceleration that we had a few years ago. So thank you so much. Hi everyone. Great to see you, Eric. You are a huge inspiration for our school. Uh, so I am a ninth and 10th grade teacher uh, in math currently. Um, and my team was one of the first to implement mastery school with our students. Um, the mastery school was a response to our students' needs. As we continue to increase the rigor in our courses as a result of research and best practices, we realized that our students weren't meeting those benchmarks. And like uh, Mr. Ocon said, um, we were not about to lower our standards and our expectations for our students. Instead, we challenged our teachers to meet our students where they were and provide support systems that were going to get them and raise them to our expectations. As a result, um, we have gone through many, many iterations of support systems, but the biggest, the biggest change has been social and emotional learning. Um, so working with Tanya, working with Damar, um, working with schools across the city and recognizing that our students are human, recognizing their humanity, recognizing that the things that happen outside of my classroom impact a lot of what's happening in my classroom. And that is where Mastery School allows students the grace to live their full lives uh, and not have these consequences you know, of the current system as it exists because it's not serving our students. So we took the system and we started to make changes. Um, one of the things that I know uh, Principal Jackson said that this year uh, derailed us a little bit. I, my team actually took it as a, a pretty great challenge. Um, we had to think about how we were going to reach out to our students um, and start to include some of those things and strategies that we were using in mastery school within the school year to avoid mastery school altogether, if possible. Um, and we've actually seen some really great success. We're using some modified adaptive pacing models. So our students aren't moving at their own pace entirely, um, but we dedicate the last month of school uh, to students allowing to reassess and relearn um, and to get the support that they need. Because especially in math, like maybe you saw um, solving quadratic functions in February and it just takes you three weeks of sitting with that and, and processing it and going to different content and coming back to it and revisiting it in a cycle um, for it to really sit with you. And so um, our, our mastery school, we are still going to have mastery school this summer, um, but our numbers have actually gone down quite a bit because we've learned how to integrate the strategies from mastery school into the regular school year, because why not? Why are we waiting until this summer? I don't wanna give up my summer. I mean, I will because that's part that that's what comes with the job, but these strategies work, and so we're implementing um, uh, 
strategies from our uh, diverse learners accommodations with our gen ed students where we're taking these strategies and giving and front loading them so that our students can be successful. Um, and it, it's been really great, so great that we are actually um, having some issues with our numbers uh, and the types of accelerated classes that we're offering. We actually are not offering um, one of our acceleration classes this summer, the one that I usually teach, because we don't have enough staff uh, uh, to teach <laughs> the accelerated numbers at our senior year. So um, Michael and I, along with a couple of our teammates have actually revamped our scope and sequence um, to offer more acceleration during the school year because summer acceleration is inaccessible to a lot of our students. So we are finding ways to make 38 school weeks uh, and, and provide those opportunities to our students. Um, so I am really excited about it. It's going to be a ton of work, but I just, it makes my heart so happy being a CPS alum, being a student who needed these opportunities myself, um, to be able to give that back to my community and to my students because they deserve it. They deserve the world. Um, so you can, uh, go to the next slide, Sarah, and Michael's going to talk a little bit about summer acceleration. Hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to talk about, first of all, uh, DeMar gave some really impressive numbers overall, uh, what we've been doing in CPS in terms of accelerating our students. Um, but I first want to just kind of bring some context to why it's so important to us at Brooks. And it's kind of the cornerstone of why we developed a STEM, our STEM department, uh, you know, six or seven years ago. And it's based on the fact that there, there aren't enough people of color in STEM related fields, it's just a fact. And unfortunately, I was just reading an article and it's gotten worse. Uh, it, it talked about the total black um, undergrad en enrollment is down 7% in STEM, STEM related uh, uh, fields. Um, and unfortunately, you know, another sad part to that too is like with COVID-19 um, pa pandemic hitting, those numbers are, are further going to drop. So that really gives some context of why acceleration is so important to us. And, you know, and the reason that is, is because we know that um, the number, you know, one of the, the number one indicators of success in these programs is early access to college level courses. So students can be successful in uh, STEM related fields, whether it's engineering or mathematics, and it doesn't stop there, finance, business, um, medicine and beyond. And so that's why, you know, we really, uh, that is really important to us. Uh, we won't go back to it, but the, the previous slide kind of showed you um, our different pathways students have to access it. And as Julia was saying, it's so great that that changes all the time because we are getting more uh, students accelerated now. So we have to keep on reconstructing it to kind of continue to meet the needs of our student, which is students, which are super exciting. Uh, this slide here just talks about the, just what we've been able to do with uh, uh, with the Mara support and CPS just over the last two summers with summer acceleration here. And we were talking 63 students from the last two summers in both integrated math two and pre-calc. Uh, we're given 63 more students an opportunity to be more successful in a STEM related field. And even if it's not a STEM related field, uh, students have options, all right? They're not picking their college majors based on uh, what you know, based you know, based based on what they want to do, and and not based on things like, well, I'm not so good with the math, or my science is a little weak, so I'll, I'll, I'll major in in this area instead. Um, so that's that's why uh, we get really excited when we talk uh, about acceleration at Brooks. And uh, next slide, please, Sarah. And so um, I wanted to go over. So instead of kind of going over the the, the uh, that one slide with all the different pathways, I thought, you know, I thought of this family here that perfectly represented uh, what experience would look like at our school in terms of accessing our accelerated classes. Uh, the family you see here, uh, we have uh, three brothers and a sister. All right. Uh, so they all sent, you know, they sent uh, their, their four kids to Brooks. Two of them graduated. Uh, we got Luke and Ben graduated. 
Uh, Joseph is a senior and Isabella is, is a seventh grader in our AC program. And um, I just, uh, it was, you know, I've had, I had Luke, Ben and Joseph, and it's just amazing how like when you, uh, siblings in a family, how just different they are from each other. Um, and uh, so this kind of talks to that effect where, you know, starting with Luke, um, uh, when he started, very motivated student uh, right off the bat. Uh, I remember I didn't get to work with him until uh, AP Calculus. I but, had him freshman year. We always knew. Yeah. He was yeah. a kid we were creating opportunities for. I, very social. It, he found me. He, I, I, told, I uh, taught uh, like a, robot, a robotic class. Early on, I knew him. I said, you know what, uh, Luke, we got to get you into this. Uh, we were able to, but unfortunately, Luke was an accelerated in middle school. So uh, and when I talked to him, Luke, we got to get you into this double period uh, uh, accelerated class, which is the, the third down there, his uh, junior year. And uh, which was amazing because he was able to take algebra two and pre-calculus. So we got him to calculus uh, by the time he was a senior. And, um, and so to compare that with Ben, his brother, completely different. Uh, ben really struggled when he was a, a freshman, sophomore, uh, not very focused, uh, had trouble, um, especially in math too, especially in math. And uh, for Luke, he didn't start really getting focused uh, until he was a junior uh, in INT3, that's math three basically, and where he started seeing himself in college in a STEM field and he knew how important it was to get as far as he could and build a really strong foundation in math. So, uh, and I think this was 2019 summer, we were able to uh, accelerate Ben uh, to where he was able to reach AP Calculus his senior year. And again, without these opportunities, uh, uh, Ben would have never had that experience. And you could see completely different uh, between Ben and Luke, completely different um, and Joseph, uh, who is now a senior, uh, has a, a very similar uh, pathway uh, from, uh, from uh, Ben's. Uh, and, and I would say, like, focus-wise, early on, he's kind of in between uh, uh, Ben and Luke and kind of following this, the, the similar pathways here. Um, now, Isabella uh, is a seventh grader. I've, I actually haven't gotten to meet her yet, but uh, she's looking to get you know, her uh, algebra credit by, you know, after her eighth grade year. So she's going to be coming into uh, her freshman year already at uh, INT2 level. So, you know, again, just illustrating, you know, how, you know, the different ways students can uh, um, access our pathways. All right. And Next just for those of you that aren't oh, familiar, um, we use the integrated math curriculum, so that's why it's INT1, INT2. Um, so INT1 represents the algebra credit, INT2 represents geometry, INT3 would be algebra two with trig, um, and then pre-calc calculus. All right, and then so I guess the question is, where are they now? So next slide there. All right, so uh, I mean, I, I just, I love the family here. I love this family. I mean, look at him, Luke, uh, who's a well, you know, into his uh, college career here is majoring in technical system management at University of Illinois. Uh, ben, again, the, remember Ben, the, the very unfocused, not sure, really struggled in math. Look at Adam now. He's, he's, he's majoring. He's a freshman. He's almost done with his freshman year, very successful year. He's majoring in mechanical engineering at Iowa State. And uh, Joseph to follow also to Iowa State uh, in chemistry, you know, all three in, in, in STEM related fields. And uh, it's just, it's very exciting to kind of see. Um, and Isabel, we don't know. I mean, <laughs> she, she, she could, uh, but the, even if, if it's not a STEM career, uh, she'll have the foundation and she'll have options to make the choice that she wants to make. Next slide. And, um, and we've kind of talked about it already uh, Julia did a nice job explaining it, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate the fact that, you know, acceleration doesn't just happen from a year to year basis. It doesn't just happen over the summer. 
um, semester to semester. Uh, it's an ongoing process within the classroom. Uh, we have students moving at with, within, the, within their own pace. Um, and as, and uh, also not, not just moving at different paces, we have students working in the same class on different standards. Uh, and then also knowing that um, you could be a really strong student say in math, but that doesn't mean you're good at every single thing or every topic or concept in math that sometimes you may uh, need to be re uh, accelerated because you understand it and there's no reason to kind of go over again, or you, you might have to uh, kind of take a couple steps back and kind of review and get a little more support. Uh, so yeah, so thank that's you. that's why, yeah, Sorry. go ahead, Julia. So I was just gonna say thank you so much to Brooks. I really appreciate your presentation. And I know we've got a couple of really nice questions in the Q&A, but I'm gonna wait until we have a chance to hear from PSMA too, because I really wanna um, give them a chance to tell us their story. Jamar, do you wanna introduce? Yeah, sure. So to talk more about acceleration, uh, Phoenix Military, Phoenix STEM Military Academy. Um, we'll hear from Principal Wapachet, um, Ms. Tobias, and Ms. Jones. I'll pass it along to you. Um, thank you, Damar and Gingers. Um, it is my honor to be here to um, represent PSMA Phoenix STEM Metal Academy. I got many questions about how would I define CBE competency based education in, in, in a sentence or two? Um, let, let me preface it very quickly. Um, first of all, it's not when. Um, so algebra one is technically supposed to be ninth grade curriculums according to um, state of Illinois. If the teacher, um, if, if the kids can do that, um, algebra one at seventh grade, why not? So it's not when, it's not where. So um, as, as we uh, uh, experience um, 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 pandemics, some kids excel um, in, in um, remote setting, right? So it's not where nor when. So what is it? Um, the way we look at Phoenix is how well, how well the student meet the standards and assessment. Um, next slide, please. So it's how well. Um, quick big pictures. Everything we do here is data uh, at Phoenix, and, and, and I always have a phrase um, to my faculty members, in data we trust. Everything else is secondary. So um, almost all meeting we bring data, whether, whether it's social emotional uh, data or, or AP or, or anything, it's, it's always data. And this is a quick snapshot of, of, of Phoenix um, demographics. So 78% um, 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 Latinx students and 15% and about African-Americans and, and so on. Um, I do mentor, um, I'm sure principal, he's, um, his third year is going to his second contract. Um, his name is Anthony Rodriguez. So as we um, um, do instructional round, one thing he noticed is um, he said WIP, that, well, that's just my short name. So WIP, you and I got the same demographic. The only difference is you got student in uniform. So that's just PSMA. Um, so that's the demographics, low incomes, almost 90%, diverse learners, 7%, EL student is increasing. Um, so this is a big picture of Phoenix. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So I have known um, um, Principal O'Korn um, uh, um, almost 20 years. Um, um, I know he's, he's like the founding father of, of, of this, this movement, um, um, start out with standard-based gradings. And then of course, he, then he um, 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 moved on to um, competency-based education. So anyhow, I started this um, um, PSMA back in 2004, as you can see the AC, ACT composite was 13.8. With 13.8, um, um, basically the inference skill is, is almost non-existent. Everything is recall, right? So that's, um, so about 2010, I heard about um, um, standard-based grading. So I'm trying to copy and paste um, Principal, Principal, Principal O'Conn. Um, and we continue that. Um, back then we used AVID. So we became AVID um, National Demonstration Site. So we graduated from AVID and then we insert um, College Board um, Advanced Placement Program. Back then it was AP classes, not, not PSAT. 
So about um, 2013, um, um, according to CPS rating, level one is the highest rating back then. It's almost like a school report card. Um, and, and 2015 to now is, is level one plus. So we, we maintain that. Um, so again, data in data we trust. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this slide, uh, I, I do have two members, that, uh, two members of senior leadership team members uh, that joined me, um, Mrs. Tobias and Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Tobias will briefly talk about how we integrate this process. And Ms. Jones will talk about uh, um, 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 what happened and the result. So without further ado, I'll mute myself and I'll, um, uh, Mr. Tobias, come on up, please. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Mr. Wilpatchett. It's been an honor and a privilege to be on this journey with him so, for so many years. And um, in order to make that journey happen, many years ago, we realized that uh, a realignment had to happen. And um, we went to uh, a cycle of three where we had uh, collaboration and communication at the center of everything that we did. So uh, departmental and grade level um, alignment took place. And we also made sure to have um, our general meetings where everyone was on, on, on pace, had the same information so we could move forward together as a school. Uh, as uh, we began to embrace SBG and then move forward to more currently uh, SEL exemplary school and then CBE, uh, we noticed that we needed to move to a cycle of four. And what that entails is that we provided time to process, to develop our skills, uh, collaboration, input, buy-in. Uh, through a cycle of four where we included uh, the teachers at all levels. So it's been a process. It has not been overnight. We figure again, uh, being led by that data, that that is how we move. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Now, currently we are Phoenix STEM school and we are very proud of that. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, we are embracing it and so uh, we are combining uh, being an SEL exemplary school with our CBE uh, school-wide initiatives and as a STEM school. How do we plan to do this? Well, student enrichment and acceleration are at the heart of it. So by providing equity and access to all students, um, we can give them those, that opportunity that they need uh, to have more uh, better post-secondary success and to complete, to be on track. Uh, additionally, uh, we promote access to all rigorous courses in our school, honors and AP curriculum. At the heart of this is building the capacity of our teachers and having them be the driving force. And um, we are also using performance-based assessments school-wide. Uh, I will now introduce Ms. Jones. She will talk more about AP. Hello, I'm Ms. Jones. So uh, thank you, Mr. Bias. So how do we know it's working? As Mr. Whip said, in data we trust. So <laughs> CBE has really been like our, our compass, our guide towards increasing access and not just our top students, all of our students at uh, PSMA. So as our, uh, as we revamped our CBE and integrated CBE into more of our classes, we noticed that our total enrollment in AP has increased. So in um, 2014, we had 159 students, which made up about 49% of our student body at that time. And this year, thank you, Mr. Bias, we had 310 students enrolled in AP despite the pandemic, and that's 60%. Uh, We're only at 550 students. Um, yeah, just CBE, CBE fit everything we were trying to do. And we really attribute most, a lot of our success to summer acceleration. I mean, for the past three weeks, I have been really working with Mr. Bice and Mr. Whip on creating more uh, access for our incoming freshmen. So we will have about 120 rising ninth graders participating in our summer acceleration courses. And they should be able to take APS freshmen. So 
put in, you know, placing them on the journey towards AP with support. Um, summer acceleration gives them that motivation and encouragement to say, hey, I can do it. You know, they're not nervous their first day in AP. They know us, they bug us, it's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, CBE has been just amazing for PSMA. I, I can talk about it all day. <laughs> Next slide. Um, once again, you can see how our uh, AP enrollment has increased and our next goal is attainment. So in the beginning, it was mostly AP Spanish that our students were enrolled in. But as students uh, had more voice and more input about the classes they wanted to take, we added AP Computer Science, AP Calculus, AP Lang, AP Lit. So we have more rigorous AP courses and we noticed that attainment is right around like 65, 70%. So hopefully with more summer acceleration and preparation, where it'll lead to more attainment. And, and that's our next goal. And next slide. So I will reintroduce Mr. Whip to talk about how CBE fits into our new school vision. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, so we are, um, as a school STEM, it's not a STEM department. Um, we wanted to STEM across the curriculums. So we have partnered with NASA um, um, for PDs, um, and, and, and I always I always have a litmus question for you know for anything we do in our, in the meetings. So what does STEM look like in English too? If an instructor cannot answer that, then we need to go back again and we we reshuffle this whole process again. So um, I think the Ma went to a couple of my meetings. This is very action um, I, I, um, action item oriented or solution based. Um, um, complaining is it, it is it doesn't go far um, at PSMA. So um, PSMA SQRP SQRP um, um, basically a school report card. Um, um, every elementary school and, and every high school got SQRP um, um, school report card rating. And um, right behind me is is the SQRP that that is like in data we trust. So um, um, if any department or grade level is red, and then you know we're gonna be zooming into that to, to that metric. Um, FOT, freshman on track, summer on tracks. Um, this is the first year that CPS is doing freshman on track and sophomore on track. Um, as you know, PSMA, we have been doing that. We just call it differently. We just call it STEM connection, but it's, it's, it's um, freshman connection, sophomore connection. For us, it's STEM connection. Um, the data that we have not shown you is, is, is um, because we're running out of time, is PSAT. The conversation around Phoenix is, is either PSAT 9, PSAT 10, or SAT 11, or advanced placement. Those are the two heavy assessments that we align to. Uh, and how do we do it? By, by using project-based learning and project-based assessment. But at the end of the day, it have to hit those metric of PSAT 9, 10, or SAT 11, um, or advanced placement three or higher. Um, so that's all we have at this point. I'll gladly turn it back to um, 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 Dama and Ginger. Thank you. Um, feel free to contact me, I'm, I'm CPS mail, um, um, fwapatchet at cps.edu. I, I usually respond within, within 24 hours. Um, if it's summertime, it might be 48 hours, just, just FYI. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Principal Webb. Thank you um, to all the presenters from PSMA. And actually, we have a question for, I think, any of you, whoever is up for, for jumping in. Um, how did you recast your school leadership, vision, and culture to bring this experience to life? Um, as leaders, how did you shift your style overall and your priorities? Somebody want to jump in on that? Sure. Go ahead, Whip. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Principal Jackson. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Awesome metrics too. Um, so for us, we started with kind of the summer design program and looking at our data, like our qualitative and our quantitative data from the school. So what were our students saying as well as some of our metrics? And we use that kind of as a starting base of, you know, how can we, in, in collaboration, I guess I should say, in conjunction, 
um, with our mission, which is to ensure each student learns at high levels. So putting that together and looking at our qualitative and quantitative data in the alignment to our mission and thinking about how do we actually live out our mission um, every single day and really support each of our students um, individually and meet them where they are. And so that was the basis of it. But then the real change came um, with, with doing the work, doing some readings, engaging in resources, um, and having prof professional development. Uh, but I think what was actually really key was teacher leadership. Um, that was huge at our school. So we have a PD at Brooks team where we have a group of teacher leaders uh, who are exceptional and they try different uh, innovative things in their classrooms. And then they actually help to develop or they develop and lead the professional development. And I think that was really key because our teacher leaders were on fire and motivated and really believe in what they're implementing. And that just spread like wildfire in our school, but it also helped other teachers to get on board because they had teacher leadership that could model how to put that best practice in place and implement it in their classroom. So I think that was really big. I mean, there was a lot of nuances in between that, but I do think starting with the vision and our data was key, and as well as making sure that our teacher leadership was on board um, because inevitably that was huge in shifting the culture in our school. Because if it's from the top and it's just the leadership saying that, as everyone knows, that generally doesn't work, right? It has to be a community and a team who believes in that vision and what we see for kids. And so um, that was huge for us. Can I'd love to add to that because Principal Jackson is my admin. Um, I have gone into her office and given her a lot of crazy ideas and she doesn't shut me down. Um, she works with me and we, I mean, I remember learning about FOT and I was just like, metrics, um, we need to do what's best for students. And they just happened to be tied together it, hand in hand and I didn't realize that. And so instead of her coming to me and saying like, the metrics are bad, we worked together to say, how are we going to problem solve this? And, and we're very solution oriented. Um, and so I felt like I could take some risks and my job wasn't, you know, in jeopardy. <laughs> um, because this is, this is a seven year partnership. We, we've been working for a long time now. Um, but it, it, like Michael said in the chat, it, it's a safe place to take some of those leaps of faith um, because we believe in our students and we believe in our teachers. And so the worst that can happen is we try again and, and we continue to iterate because that's what we're teaching our students is to be problem solvers. It's to be solution oriented and to be self-aware when something fails and, and to continue to grow. So we are practicing a lot of the competencies as staff that we expect from our students. Um, and so that, I, th I think that partnership um, really is a lot there. Thank you. Uh, Principal Whip, please go ahead. So oh, very quickly for PSMA, um, um, I think for me as this is my 17 years on the job, um, it's, it's how I narrate the vision. Um, we copy and paste Principal O'Conn, so I cite him correctly from standard-based gradings. Um, uh, and as we shift to competency-based education, um, the first thing the teachers would say, I mean, they, they, you know, like Principal Jackson said, teacher capacity. Oh, another change, this is all, all, a lot of work, blah, 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 and all of that. So um, when I narrate this, this CBE, uh, I kind of spin it differently, uh, you know, um, um, so I spin it to the teachers and the general meeting. It's like um, competency-based education is student accountability. The minutes I say that, oh, they all end. No matter what, it's almost like blind faith. <laughs> they, they just end. Um, um, if, we, if, if we say teacher accountability, they don't like that, but when, when we spend it, teach our, uh, student accountability. Um, uh, so that, that, that's our step one to, to um, kind of sell it to um, PSMA 
faculty members. Thank you. I also wanted to, to ask if, uh, given the pandemic disruption, if anybody could weigh in on what summer acceleration and and this summer is going to look like in it that's different than other years. How are you need, finding that you need to adapt? Okay, for Phoenix, um, last school year, okay, um, um, the incoming freshman, freshman class is 100, about 155 students. Last school year, we had um, um, two explore computer science and one intro to engineering. Oh, just, just by the way, those classes are one of those um, 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 graduation requirements um, for CPS. It's called ECS, Explore Computer Science. And, and, and um, so there were, we had three sections last year. This year, we are projecting four sections of two sections of intro to engineering design and two sections of Explore Computer Science. So that's what we're looking at about 120 students out of 150. So technically that, that is pretty much itself is, is freshman connection, um, but we do it with credit. Um, secondly, the, the, the incoming sophomore class, um, um, like just like how I mentioned um, um, algebra one, why not seven grades? So um, some of the student according to um, 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 PSAT or we have internal um, 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 assessment called academic approach, um, which is CPS vendor approved. And we align that and then we try to target certain specific groups, but we open to all. Um, so they will take um, honors English too. So when they complete those classes um, in July and August of honor English too, we will program them to AP seminar. So um, that, that's second strategy. The third one is geometry. Um, if you work with Dr. Jackson, they, um, um, she always put um, um, veteran teacher in, in, in subcommittee. So I'm, I'm, I'm in PSAT committee. Um, so um, with that said, um, according to college board, we designed a PSAT geometry technically supposed to be one semester class, right? Because they are heavy into algebra or algebra one or algebra two. So with that said, um, uh, um, we put geometry this summer for um, um, open group and, and this, this incoming summer will take geometry and then um, when they complete that class, it have to be minimum at least a C. So if they don't get a C in, in that class based on PSAT standards and assessment, we program them back to geometry in, 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 in September. But if they do pass, then, then we accelerate them to algebra two. So hopefully they'll have um, um, access to AP calculus by the end of senior years. Senior years. Um, uh, military school, um, that, 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 this is one battle that I always fight with um, uh, um, perceptions. Um, um, people think that um, uh, military school or Phoenix uh, Military Academy is, 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 is pre boot camp. And I just want to emphasize, as you can see, the, the, the only boot camp we do at Phoenix is advanced placement boot camp. Um, so we, we are heavy into AP program. Um, 500, 550 students currently, about 500 exam were given. So that is a big picture of what's happening at Phoenix. Um, so again, what, 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 to recap, what, what a way to go around English too while meeting the standards? Take English too in the summer, then go to AP seminar. Um, take geometry in the summer, then accelerate to algebra two. Thank you. Thank you. And then Ms. Jones, did you want to jump in? Just add very quickly. Um, we know with the remote setting, engagement has been an issue for a lot of our students, <laughs> ghosting, uh, just not being interested in class. So we've actually redesigned our ECS and our IED classes to be a little bit more fun and engaging. So we added robotics to uh, most of our summer acceleration class or some type of hands-on learning. And this year we're gonna go with the hybrid model. So students are in school one day a week, remote four days a week. Yeah, I wonderful. Just, I would just add Wait. across the seven schools, um, everyone is approaching it slightly differently considering um, their student population, um, the size of classes as well. So we have some remote, 
um, some shifts in terms of like shift A, shift B, and students kind of coming in at different times, so hybrid uh, as well. So we're, we're seeing a little bit of everything, but all in support of students and all considering the context of each school. I'm, I'm mindful of your time, but I, I feel like I could keep asking you questions for a really long time. So I'm, I'm sad for myself that I don't get to do that. But thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And thank you to the rest of you for joining in. And it was so great to hear these stories and I can't wait to hear more. Um, please watch our Ed Systems website for a repository of resources, for some blogs and newsletters and join us for the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And I'm just I'm grateful to have been able to hear these stories and um, hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>